Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. I'm Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and the host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, we're talking about a new book on raw feeding, why European dogs are better behaved, a new hybrid bird species in the Amazon, and how your dog can participate in Darwin's dog's DNA testing. So stay right there. Vegas Rock Dog Radio, pets, people, pop culture. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm your host, I'm Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs, and you are listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. We're a rock and roll show all about pets, people, and pop culture. In studio today is Mr. Jim. I'm here on the other side of the studio from you. He's doing all... Pushing the buttons. Pushing all the buttons. And we've got Mr. Twix and Miss Thornton in the studio. They're relaxed on new beds in the studio. Not that we need it anymore, but <laughs> sometimes you want a bed that matches the decor of the studio. So that's what I did. <laughs> Miss Galaxy always looks on from the Rainbow Bridge on the show to make sure we bring you a great show. And as I said earlier in the show, the intro, lots to talk about today. Very, very varied. So we're covering birds. We're covering European dogs, <laughs> uh, raw feeding, and um, some other fun stuff as well. So, yeah, lots to get to in this show. Um, but before we do that, I'll tell you what, let's, let's tell you where you can find us on the Internet before we even get going on any of that stuff in our weekly update like we normally do. Our website is VegasRockDogRadio.com, and you can find us on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. Just look for Vegas Rock Dog or Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On Twitter, we are Vegas Rock Dog Show, no W, and we're also just Vegas Rock Dog on Twitter. So either of those will work. And uh, we have a blog, and the blog is called TheRockAndRollDog.com. And we have an app, and you will go to yap.us, Y-A-P-P dot U-S. And it's a free app, so you'll download that onto your phone, and then you'll download the show onto your phone. And, of course, if you miss the show, don't worry. We've got you covered with that. You can do iTunes. You can do iHeartRadio. You can do Spoke by SiriusXM and any other podcast app that you may have downloaded onto your phone. We make it very easy for you, for you to find the show. You will also find us on Amazon. No. What the heck do they call it? Alexa. Google. No. <laughs> the interwebs. No. Amazon, Amazon Alexa, the, the thing. Oh, the spying device. <laughs> that's what Jim likes to call it. And you'll also find us on Sonos as well. We know that's a, a popular application. And if you listened to the show last week, Jim's not keen on me getting um, an Alexa. Alexa, what did he call it? There's a proper name for it. Alexa. N uh, it, we, you all know what I'm talking about. But I'll get one because it's going to make my life a lot easier. <laughs> so we've got you covered whether you listen to a live show or whether you want to catch the show on a podcast. It's very, very easy to listen to the show. and uh, Or you can just go to the internet and you can just search Vegas Rock Dog Radio. You'll find it. They all pop up. All the shows pop up. We also have a second show on iTunes. And it's just called Pet Tip of the Day. And it's a little 60-second blurb of a pet tip and it's a popular little micro mini mini <laughs> micro podcast but full of tips so we've got a load more new ones to add to it so uh, we'll make sure that we we put that out on um, social media so you can find those tips 
So here's our weekly update. Um, a lot happens from one week to the next. Um, always there's some kind of fundraiser. We fundraise all year round for Animal Rescue. And we've just planned a rocket Rock Painting Fundraiser for Animal Rescue, for Rocking for Rescues. It's Sunday, February the 18th, and it's from 11 to 1 p.m., and it's $10. And our great friend, Joni Axelrad, and she is uh, she is a ceramics artist. It's called, her business is called The Rabbi's Wife, because she is The Rabbi's Wife. So no need to put quotes around that one. <laughs> she really is The Rabbi's Wife, but she's going to lead lead this for us. It's going to be at Public Works Coffee Bar in Henderson, Nevada. You have to bring your own paint. No, we supply everything. We make it so easy for people to have a good time and raise money. It's $10. Great coffee shop just opened up in Henderson. So if you're Henderson, Boulder City, North Las Vegas, Vegas, Mesquite, come on down. We'll take you. <laughs> we'll take your money because it all goes to helping animals in rescue. It's going to be a really, really nice event. The coffee shop's great. It does coffee. It does food. It does pastries. They also serve wine and beer, which is kind of unusual but kind of fabulous at the same time. And we'll be in the community room. It's very cool. It's very hip. So you can actually go to to buy tickets and get the information rockingforrescues.org and that's the number four rockingforrescues.org really easy I've also put up again this week my Amazon influencer link it's a new thing with Amazon it's brand brand new it's for influencers and are you very influential? I like to think I am I like to put out solid information and I also like to tell people about great products which is what this is so the Amazon um, influencer link is amazon.com backslash shop backslash Vegas Rock Dog Radio I think I hope anyway you'll find it on a Facebook page but each week I keep adding a recommended product on there I make sure it's a good quality product one that's uh, functional and fashionable and just makes your lives better and your pet's lives better whether it's a really gorgeous, cuddly pet blanket that will last every time you wash it, it's great. Or whether it's, for example, you may have seen them, is to wash your pet's paws. This would be fantastic for my friends back home in England. Anywhere that you're walking your dogs in, it's wet or it's snowy, yeah? Because we don't have to worry about that in Vegas. We don't have to worry about smelly, wet dog, dirty paws, mud, any of that stuff. <laughs> this is just dust more than anything. But the great thing is, is with this paw, um, it's like a paw bath. It's portable. You put your water in it. I mean, for us, we use it for a um, povidone iodine foot bath, you know, for itchy paws. And it creates no mess and put the paw goes in, shake it around. It does, the water doesn't come out. And then you can pat dry their feet and you're good to go before they jump in your car or, you know, come straight into the house with dirty paws. But it's a great little invention i wish i'd invented it myself but the, those are the kind of products i like to put on the link to make sure that that uh, it, they're good quality and they're very very helpful so what should we start with jim do you have any updates no i i uh i didn't have too busy a week this week i played a I played some nice shows and saw some people from out of town and got a big week coming up don't we Musically, I have a big week coming. You do, up. yeah. Well, I I'm don't. Busy like five nights next week. Oh, you are. You see, <laughs> this is how busy we are. Now I get to catch up with you and find out what's going on next week. What are you doing next week? Uh, Monday's dark. Uh, oh yeah. Smith Center. Yeah. Then South Point. Yes. And then I got to go to Mesquite Saturday. Oh yeah, you do have a busy week. You do. Friday, I'm not sure. I thought I had something Friday. But Last night he played. A Tom Jones tribute. I did. So I didn't go. I was busy. But uh, yeah, he he played that tonight. But his main playing gig is with Frankie Moreno. And uh, if you haven't seen the show, definitely go and see it. There are lots of opportunities. Really, really easy. Not to be confused with the drag queen Frank, Frank Moreno. Two completely different people doing very different things in town. <laughs> Both very, very good. <laughs> the amount of times only the names sound the same. Uh, the amount of times I've taken people to see Frankie Moreno's show, and they go, "Oh my gosh, he still has a show! I haven't seen his show in years." And I just know they think they're seeing a drag queen. Yeah. <laughs> Completely different show. And then I don't tell them until the opening number. 
And I go, you thought you were going to see a drag queen. And we laugh about that. But uh, both shows are <laughs> very, very good. But they are two different people. Uh, so that's, uh, so yeah, okay. So you've got a busy week then uh, ahead of you as well. Uh, time, I tell you, it goes so fast. I can't believe next week is the end of January. I have a Valentine's photo fundraiser. And it's a sip, shop and donate event at Wags and Whiskers down in Green Valley. And then on the 28th, we've got one at Barking Dogs. So lots going on. So that's our weekly update. That's pl- That's plenty. Well, I wanted to get on top of this book review, which I've had in my hands since I think before Christmas. And <laughs> and uh, I finally got round to it. And it's A Novice's Guide to Raw Feeding for Dogs by Kimberly Morris Gauthier. Gauthier sorry. If you've listened to the show probably a year ago, maybe a bit more than that, I had Kimberly come on the show to talk about raw feeding. Yeah. Now, she ca- she comes from, she, it, back then, it was, this is just my personal experience of learning about raw feeding. Yeah. She's not a veterinarian. She's not a, a, a nutritionist for pets or anything like that. Saying that, though, she has since got certified. But back then... She'd, what she found herself doing was being in various raw feeding groups. Her, her dog needed some help, and so she thought, well, I'm going to try and look at this diet. <laughs> and she said some, some groups were pretty vicious to be in. If you weren't doing a, what they deemed 100% perfect raw feeding, they, they didn't want to help you. She got kicked out of a variety of groups for suggesting certain things and asking questions, and she just said, I'll oh, forget that. I'll start my own group, and I'm on my own own journey. Um, and now what I did at the end of 2016 is I made this prediction that 2017, last year, would be the year of nutrition for pet parents. There would just be this big interest in nutrition. Fast forward to present day, and that prediction couldn't be any closer to the truth, could it really, Jim? It's been no, I think you, you nailed that one. It's been a really oh. good year. It's been very exciting to see that interest. Uh, and there was a big explosion of interest by pet parents wanting to provide better nutrition for their pets. And part of that interest, or well actually a big part of that interest, came from a documentary by Cole Harrington, who we also had on the show. His documentary is called Pet Fooled. If you haven't seen it, grab it on Netflix and watch that thing first. If you, I always say to people, if you're not sure where to start, watch that one first. And the documentary exposes the practices within the commercial pet food industry. Not all food is created equal, and you need to know this. And following this documentary, pet parents had questions. They had lots and lots of questions. And who were they going to look towards for this information? And, and it was a great thing that this happened, because it was all of a sudden like, whoa, I need to do something. And so, you know, when pet parents reach out to me and they're craving this nutritional information, my first recommendation, as I say, is watch Pet Fooled first and then head on over to Dr. Karen Becker, Rodney Habib, and Kimberly Morris Gautier's Facebook pages. These three people, passionate about animals and in particular a desire for them to thrive from a species-appropriate diet, what they're meant to be eating, yeah? Not what some glossy package tells you you should eat in a pet store Um, and each of these people come with a different experience with animals from being a holistic integrated veterinarian to a raw feeding blogger who took a journey into the world of raw to solve the many health issues a dog had and that blogger is Kimberly Morris Gauthier. This week I've been I say dedicated to reading the book and, and reviewing this book Uh, She inspired us to start making some changes, and she's grown her Facebook group exponentially. It's unbelievable. Huge. 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 She became this welcoming person, unlike what she received (laughs) in the group she was in. She's very welcoming, and she, she shares everything, and she answers your questions. And she said, you know, I just... I, I just did this from, she, it was a documentation really of her own journey. That's what it was. And so what she did, she switched to a raw diet to give her dog Rodrigo, she's got four dogs now, uh, to give him some relief from environmental and food allergies, ear infections, chronic diarrhea, skin rashes, itchy pores, and joint pain. And any of those issues, you know, by itself can be terrible for a dog to have to endure, let alone all of them together. And that's a lot. She also wants to give her dog a species-appropriate diet to eliminate highly processed food from his diet. And we know for humans, highly processed food is not good for us, and it's certainly not good for pets either. Now, when she first started Raw, she felt it was 
She felt it was expensive. I think that's one of the first things we hear as well. She felt it was expensive, yet today she cut back. she's cut back her monthly budget by 50%. That's really? huge. From yeah. getting off of well, the traditional From getting on that f- off that kind of food and through the way that she sources her food. So in her book, she explains how you can reduce your food expenses with cost-effective solutions, like buying from a co-op. I don't even know if we have a co-op. We have a farmer's market. Oh, we have the farms. Uh, we do have... Yeah. Two farms, I think. It's something we, d- we, d- we need to look into further for our region, yeah? And in the first two weeks of feeding, Rodrigo was, you know, being given fresh food. She saw an improvement in him, even though she was only gradually introducing fresh food into his diet. So this mm. was a small change that was clearly having an impact. That was in two weeks. She wasn't full raw. She wasn't full anything. She was just slowly adding things in and, you know, not a full-on, you know, diet. And one of the things that she says in the book, and it stands out, and she says, dogs can survive on kibble, but they can't thrive. And we want our dogs to thrive. We all know what it's like. Like I said, humans, poor nutrition, mm, you know, poor health generally. Now, Kimberly, in the beginning of her raw food journey, found, found it to be confusing, and she said complicated and very contradictory. And one of those examples is where raw feeders, feeders were championing adding uh, yogurt to a, a dog's raw diet, while others said, oh, no, 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 that's a big no-no. Mm-mm, don't be adding that into the diet. And it's this kind of confusion that can very easily put someone off from embracing a raw diet, don't you think? Yeah. Because <laughs> you just yep. think, oh, really? How do I get an answer? I don't like. I don't like when people go go militant, hardcore on me on anything. So if you try to force me, then I'm gonna push back. Oh, I know that. Mm. <laughs> you too. <laughs> oh yeah, that's me as well. You didn't learn. Uh, but not for Kimberly though. She's very persistent. She's very persistent. And it spurred her on to educate herself even further. You know, instead of just taking that as, you know, that's the answer, I need to do more research. So she was constantly educating herself throughout this whole process. And interestingly enough, the other two people I mentioned earlier, Dr. Karen Becker and Roddy Habib, are two of the people that she actually, you know, looks to and communicates with for even more information. And she feels, she really feels it's her responsibility to share her knowledge uh, the benefits of raw feeding, and a way to transition without all the hurdles that she encountered on her journey. Basically, she w- she went through trials and tribulations to make it easier for the rest of us to transition. So she took the pain out of it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kimberly. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, this book is, I would say, it's truly a gift to a pet parent who is ready to move on to a healthier species appropriate diet for their dog. It It's Yes, that's all I'm saying, because I'm going to now give you the review of what's in the book itself. It was chock full, I have to tell you. I had to take a lot of notes, a lot of sticky notes for things that stood out to me. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And wow, I didn't expect that in the book. So basically, the the Quick Start Guide to Feeding Raw outlines a three-week plan to introduce raw. And she emphasizes not to introduce too many foods at once. Because she experienced this in a way of a two-day poopocalypse. <laughs> oh. Poomageddon. Oh. She had a poomageddon going on. Aren't you glad that she warned us all about that? Because, <laughs> th- th- yeah. Because I think a lot of people, if they saw that, they would might think, oh my gosh, this is, this is terrible for my dog. I'm going to stop that right now. So she said, you know, you can avoid that. Just don't say, you know, do a full-on switch. And uh, that's most, that. we thank her for people, that as well. Yeah, most people know now that you make gradual changes in the diet, not stark, yeah. quick ones. Too. Um, and, of course, she, education is going to be an ongoing part of being a raw feeder. And Kimberly recommends that you join raw feeding Facebook groups and you watch YouTube videos and you gather your information from a lot of sources, and not just one, which I think is very open of her. Instead of just saying, oh, join my group, read my book, she's saying... There's a lot of information, lots of new information, lots of research still coming out. So you've got to keep on top of this. Now, the guide, it has you start by sourcing a quality pre-made diet. So this is this is something different from a full raw, yeah? It's mm-hmm. a pre-made diet, quality though. It's the easiest way to transition while you research your balanced recipes. Because if you want to get started straight away, this is going to be the easiest way. And you're going to research your balanced recipes that you can make on your own from scratch. That is your goal, yeah? If you don't get there, not a problem because already this this change of adding a pre-made diet is going to be 
very, very beneficial. And there's a list of the very brands she used when she started out. And she still feeds some of them as well as her fully prepped meals. It's like a restaurant that she's running at her house. It's fantastic. She's got four dogs. And they're big dogs. They're, they're not, you know, little teeny, teeny tinies. Anyway, during the beginning phase, you'll you'll learn how to plan, source, store, and budget for your meals. So sourcing the right way and becoming a DIY raw feeder is going to be your way to cut your, your food budget. It is. I'm following you. Yeah. And I do find it interesting because, you know, I've had a few people this week actually reach out about this. Uh, I, I showed some videos and they said, I watched Pet Fold. Oh, my gosh. What do I do now? I don't know where. I don't know what to do next. And then the first one of the first questions I got was, it's bad enough as feeding the family, let alone the dogs. But, you know, if you're cooking for yourself and you're not actually cooking, you're prepping. But if you are prepping for your family, you can prep for your pets as well. So I find that quite interesting. You know, now you're not doing double duty all the time. Um, so what she does is she's um, she's saying, basically, if you go f- full raw, you know, you are really going to be able to cut your budget down. Of course, the convenience of pre-made frozen raw saves time. Of course it does. But it is a little bit more expensive, but it's certainly a lot healthier than what you're feeding prior to that, your kibbles and that kind of thing. And what Kimberly does is she prepares her meals in bulk. And she uses that time to catch up on movies or she listens to an audio book. And often you can actually catch her on one of her live streams as she preps the meals in her kitchen. And she preps two weeks. I think it's for two weeks at a time. How long does it take her to prep? Like, say, I two think weeks she said. Meals. I think she said something like four hours. I'd lose. I don't know. No, but you think that, uh, think that. about this. She's got four dogs, though. Bear that in mind. Mm. She's got four dogs. And she's prepping for two weeks. I think it's two weeks. I would need to double check that. But she's prepping for, you know, a couple of weeks. And bear in mind, she's going full raw. So that means she's also preparing her her uh, vegetable base mix or vegetable and fruit base mix as well. Yeah. But she does. She gets on Facebook and she she you can an- ask questions and she'll answer them for you. And I think that's really really great. And it just gives you an opp- opportunity to connect with her, like real life information. How are you doing this? What equipment are you using? How are you storing the stuff? How long does it last for? It's all very very practical. She really takes all the pain out of it. Like I said earlier. It is a practical guide. You just follow weeks one through three, and it covers sourcing, prepping, portion control based on your dog's weight and activity level, which is going to be important, and when to feed. And during that time, she lets you know to observe your dog's poop and what to look for with this new diet. We all know how poop tells the story of health. <laughs> I'm a um, I'm a poop clairvoyant. I was going to say a poopologist. <laughs> yes, because I always examine poop because we learned that since we were kids. Yeah. When you look at your poop. Yes. It's an indicator of your health. Look at your pet's poop. It will tell you something, whether it's good or bad. Then mm-hmm. you can do something about it. What if your pet poops five times on a dog walk? <laughs> well, I, I sometimes I think it's I think it's Mr. Twix's Morse code, I swear. They're not big giant poops, though. Um, They're not elephant poops. No, usually <laughs> two and a half out of five are big. <laughs> It goes through phases on our walk. See, <laughs> does w- stops very quickly because he has to poop. And then I think he only controls how much comes out. And then we walk like a I little bit more, and then he goes, oh, "I'm going to poop here." Most control. M- and then most we cold. walk for a, like a mile, and then he goes, mm, "I'm going to go veer off here because I've got to poop again." <laughs> He's funny. He's a comical little boy. Well, those poops definitely got healthier after we saved him. That's for sure. Poor thing was eating garbage. He's eating rubbish, it yeah. Was scavenging. Yep. He was eating like a wild scavenger. That's what he was doing. So poop does tell the story of health. So that she tells you what to look for. And the book covers the benefits of fasting, and that's that's something that's coming to the forefront right now. And when and when not to add supplements. For example, feeding duck feet and beef trachea to Rodrigo eliminated the need for a glucosamine supplement as they provided his joint support naturally. So she she teaches you so much stuff that you'll be able to balance up their diet, especially for their needs. Um, one quote that stood out, ideally, she said, your dogs should be able to get most of what they need nutritional, nutritionally from their raw diet. Uh, there's a resource section in the book uh, listing books, blogs, websites, videos, raw feeding Facebook groups. All will satisfy your educational needs. 
Um, the sheer collection of chapters is impressive. Some of them are, you know, reason to feed raw, balancing a diet, common fears of feeding raw, cost of feeding raw, diseases cured by a raw diet, food prep and storage, five things not to do when transitioning, holistic integrative veterinary care, and over a dozen recipes. That's what everybody wants to know is give me the recipes <laughs> so I can just follow them and away we go and how to let your dog guide you. You're going to find some dogs that say, I don't like that meat, that protein. I don't like this that's in it. And that's what she means by let your gui dog guide you as well because they're not going to eat what they don't like. <laughs> and uh, reading the book in my mind, is, is it's easy. You can jump from chapter to chapter. You don't have to read it um, in order. Like a, like a reference. Yes, like a reference. It really is. And it's full of tips to help pet parents make the transition to raw in an easy, time-saving, budget-reducing, health-improving, balanced diet for your dog. Uh, in my mind, it's the single best thing that you'll do for your dog because transitioning to a species-appropriate diet is your goal and Kimberly helps you get there because after all is said and done, our dogs are worth it. And the link is going up on Facebook if you want to pick up the book. I, I think it's worth, I think it's something like $17, $18 online. Not sure if there's a Kindle download or not. Worth getting. It honestly is. I, I found it to be a very useful book. And if you follow her in her Facebook group, anything new that's coming up research-wise, she's going to be posting it in there and letting you know about that. As I say, uh, fasting is a thing that's popping up right now. Where, uh, should you fast your pets? When do you fast your pets? How do you fast your pets? Yeah, that's going to be big. And uh, a big emphasis on supplementation. But did you know there's a lot of commercial pet foods? I'm going to say all of them probably. The cheaper ones have synthetic supplements oh, in them. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and the awful preservatives. So these are the things that you're going to eliminate from anything you could have been possibly feeding prior to wanting to go raw. There are, there are a lot of things in there. There are a lot of colorings. That are not good for your pets. It is good to know what you're feeding your pets. And you'll be in full control of that. Full control. But I always find it interesting when raw feeding comes up. It's a big topic. All of a sudden, this same article. I must have seen, seen it five times yesterday from different places. Touting. Well, basically a fear, frightening people saying, oh, but what about all the bacteria? What about the bacteria and all the meat and this, that, and the other? Well, first of all, you're buying organic is what you need to do. You're also, and the bacteria fear is really more for humans because of salmonella because they get, salmon, you get salmonella, but pets have an incredible gut. They to, can handle. Uh, yes, they do, that more. they can deal with that. Really, when it's a salmonella recall, it's for us. <laughs> It's not for them. But it's a, it's a fear-mongering article, and it resurfaced all over again. And veterinarians put that out, you know, all the time. But like Kimberly said to me she, uh, in, a, in a previous uh, well, uh, conversation with her, she said, you know, really? They, they, it boils down to they don't think we can wash our hands when we food prep for ourselves as well as our pets. And I just thought that was quite interesting and funny at the same time. So that's Kimberly Morris Gautier's New book, a raw, hang on, let me get the title right. I had it right in the beginning. A Novice's Guide to Raw Feeding for Dogs by Kimberly Morris Gautier. Link will be on Facebook. On that note, let's take a quick break, Jim. I need to chew on a bone in the break. <laughs> we'll be right back. You're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Pet Scene Magazine is dedicated to Las Vegas pets and the people who love them. It's a source of news and information for pet lovers, as well as offering valuable coupons and specials on pet products and services. Find them online at www.lvpetscene.com or look for them on Facebook. At Carl's Jr., not only do we make you happy with our delicious charbroiled burgers, we also make your dogs happy. Come through our drive through with your furry friends and we'll offer them a treat. We love to see their smiling faces. Our website, Carl's Jr. of Las Vegas.com, has a treat in store for its customers too. 
with free coupons anytime, so visit us often. Carl's Jr. is a proud and active supporter of animal adoption in our community. You can find us at carlsjr.com. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Welcome back. You're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Just before the break, I gave you a book review, A Novice's Guide to Raw Feeding for Dogs. And I highly recommend the book. Oh, just to let you know, I did not get paid (laughs) for that review. Mm. I don't review many books because it takes a lot of time. So you don't get paid because you don't want to have a biased review. I would never do that anyway, even I if I was paid. But now people, yeah. I am, yeah. and I, I'm, I am paid to do some reviews on some products, and I'm absolutely one hundred percent honest about them. And isn't that what you want? I mean, you just, you just can't. I can't do that. I, I, I know lots of people do, but I just can't say something's great if it isn't. It's these. It's our pets we're dealing with here. You know, I can't. No, would never happen. But no, I, I think it's a great book. I think the information is fantastic, and I think you'll find it really, really helpful. Okay, here's an interesting, very interesting thing, and I think we're going to participate in this, Jim. Darwin's oh. dogs. Not not you. The evolution of no. dogs. Darwin's dogs. Darwin. Do- Darwin's dogs. We're dog going org. to the Galapagos Islands. Oh, I'd love to go there. Mm. That's I'd the wildest place on earth. I would love to go there. They have a project, darwinsdogs.org. They have a project, and the project is at Darwin's Dogs, we are following the paw prints of canine evolution in studying how the dog genome has changed between ancient wolves and our beloved companions and work partners of today. If we learn how genetics shapes, how genetics shape behavior, we will have new insight into psychiatric and neurological diseases in dogs and people. They said, we have already brought together experts in dog genetics and behavior, but we need your help too. There is no cost to participate and any dog can join. We will ask about your dog's behavior and personality using short questionnaires on the website. We'll then mail you a kit to get a saliva sample to return to us. And using saliva samples and behavioral data from many dogs, we can find differences in DNA connected to particular personality traits or behaviors. We'll analyze the results and we'll let you know what we find. What if you send your own saliva to them? Are they going to think you're a dog? <laughs> Are they going to classify It'd be scary you? if it came back and said, you came from a dog. <laughs> your ancestors were wolves. I know you're hairy, Jim, but <laughs> only you would say something like that. Uh-huh. Trick them. Make sure they're honest. Trick them. <laughs> Say, oh, oh yeah, sorry, I sent you my saliva. Okay, now here's my dogs. <laughs> Only if they identify it as like, oh, that's not dog. That's not dog. Yeah, it's wolf. It's wolf man. It's a hybrid. You're a hybrid. Great website. I thought it was a very, very interesting thing that they're doing. Uh, I love research anyway. And we're doing more and more and more on animals, which is wonderful. Good research. I don't mean testing on them. Uh, so if you want to participate, you can go to darwinsdogs.org. One of the questions that people had on their website, and it makes sense, and you're probably asking it now in your head, which is, will you tell me about my dog's breed ancestry? We hope we can find out about each other's dog's an- ancestry. We should have ample information about your dog's DNA to do this. But there are a few hurdles, such as having adequate reference data to compare them to. It might be easy to see where your dog's DNA is similar to a common breed, like a retriever. But to know that this variation wasn't also shared with less common breeds, we'd also need samples of all the less common breeds. Given that there are several hundred breeds, this is no small task. So the more breeds that they have participate in this test, the they can I guess they can go deeper into the actual DNA where they come from. But so, so the, the, more they, breeds, the more they test animals and the more they have the unusual, a database. And the unusual breeds that you don't see that many of. For, a, for example, we don't see many Springer Spaniels here. We don't see many Corgis here. Do we, Jim? A few I know of, but not too many. You know a few Corgis? Uh, I've seen them, yeah, in the park. <laughs> I've seen Springers. There was that one that used to be called Trevor. <laughs> Remember? Yeah. <laughs> 
And we've seen Springers. Our neighbor had a Springer, and then. But you, you rarely see them. Right. One is not seeing lots, Jim. Okay. There are lots of breeds you just don't see here. Like Mr. Twix. <laughs> He's so unique. Uh, they said they are very cautious to make any promises about this kind of information, of course, and will absolutely share with you anything we find. But this project project isn't designed as a breed test. So that's, you know, that's kind of a bonus thing that you get to learn that if you can. Committing to giving this sort of answer would put us in an odd spot in those cases where ancestry cannot be determined with a high degree of confidence as we'd either let you down or have to bend the truth of the data, which they can't do. This is about discovering, like they said earlier, the um what's the word the the insight into psychiatric and neurological diseases but if you get to find out that could be kind of fun and um they said um uh they don't want th- they don't want that to happen and and they will not do the latter so they're not going to bend bend their data and anything they can share with you will be based on solid data that they're very confident in so in short they are optimistically hope to learn about your dog's ancestry but we'll let the data lead the way and not make promises where it should go. It's completely free to participate in this. Completely free. So go over to darwinsdogs.org if you want to participate. And if you've got an unusual breed that you don't see it often, and they've got the list and they actually showcase a lot of the, the dogs on their website who are participating in the program. Love that. And I think they said you get your results back within a month. I think they said that. Uh, I think that would be that would be helping science. That would be helping future dogs, it wouldn't would. it? And people. Brilliant. It is funny, though, because you think about certain breeds and you go, oh, gosh, they've got that trait. Maybe they could take DNA tests from people and go, uh, yes, you could be a dog owner. And th- then, no, you should not be a dog owner. Your genetics do not <laughs> support that. <laughs> No Wouldn't that be great if that was the you case? You, unfortunately, would not be a good dog owner because your genes say you would leave a dog in a hot car. So don't get a dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, you're not going to walk your dog. Sorry. Yes, you are lazy, so <laughs> you don't get a dog. Yeah, tell us your traits <laughs> before before you get a dog. I think it's a very, very interesting thing. I think research is great, uh, particularly when it comes to the health of pets. Here's another great topic. And it's funny how people can sometimes get their backs up about this and it makes me laugh, you know, because it's just a title. And often titles are meant to be quite provocative to get you to read the article. And so this one was called Why Are European Dogs So Well Behaved? And uh, I've forgotten who wrote this article. I thought I had it written down because I always give credit to the... Aha, here's the name. I just have to zoom in. Karma Brown. And she's a certified dog trainer. And I'm talking like a real qualification. Very impressive. Uh, She said, Karma said she recently visited American friends in the UK who had moved from Dallas to London's Kensington South. Very nice. Since relocating, they had adopted a cat and they were considering getting a puppy. However, after reviewing their previous dog experiences, they realized that the dogs they raised had not been nearly as well behaved as the dogs they saw in their new city. So they made this observation. They chatted over drinks. They asked her her opinion as a dog trainer. Why were the dogs in London better behaved than the dogs back home? It's because the British. (laughs) We have manners. You knew it was coming. You knew it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because dog, we're, we're dogs on, are raised around polite environments. We're big on manners. We're very big not on all, manners. Y- yes, all. we. You haven't met a single person in my family or friends who does not have impeccable, lovely manners, Jim, and who isn't polite. So I don't know. I don't know. Do you, you don't hang out with anyone other than them when we go home. So what's that about? You're just making things up. Sometimes when I go to my favorite village pub. There's some snooty snoot going on. That's okay. <laughs> so basically, that's the question they noticed. Why are the dogs so well behaved? What's going on? And uh, she decided she'd make a point to watch the dogs, a little bit of observing as they travel through England, Belgium, and France, and she'd report back, and these were her observations. Now, she is a trainer, so she obviously is very good at observing dogs as well and their body language, and also people and their body language and how they interact with their own own pets. 
Um, dogs in the UK and in the countries we visited were allowed almost everywhere. We saw them in bakeries in Belgium, inside French toy stores, in the Stonehenge Museum, at markets, on elevators, on the trolley, and on the train. It was common to see dogs off leash. A lot on the train? Yeah. It was common to see dogs off leash, except in areas where waterfowl were present. Because there is, there is a big respect, I will say, for wildlife and your dogs. People are very tuned into that. It was common to see dogs off leash, like she says, and children were discouraged from interacting with strangers' dogs. Over and over, her parents tell the children, don't distract them, darling. Don't distract them. Owners did not give their dogs obedience. They need that training here. I know. Owners did not give their dogs obedience commands. I never saw a dog asked to wait before going through a doorway, sit for a pat, stay quiet on a train, or lie down at a table. The dogs often did did do these things, but they were not asked to do them. Yeah, I am right there. I am right. That's social. Called, I, think, I, think, I think that's the social learning that we're le- hearing about I now. I think our sitter is like that. I think Kim is like that with dogs. Yes, I've never heard her say sit no. down, out, everybody out. For I I've so. never heard her say anything like that. And I think this this lend this goes now towards, which is another book I'm actually reviewing. So I'm going to digress for one second here as I grab a book. This is my next book review. And it is called Love is All You Need. It's by Julia Roberts. The revolutionary Bond-based approach. Julia Roberts, the actress. No. no. Pretty woman. No. We met her at Super Zoo. I don't know if you were with me or not. Um, Love is All You Need. The revolutionary Bond-based approach to educating your dog. Oh, no, sorry. The foreword was by Julia Roberts. We met Jennifer Arnold, or I did at least. Um, And it's a bestseller, which is wonderful. And what she talks about is social learning. So not a whole separate language or commands, yeah. It's more of a social thing. The only way, and I say I'm going to read the book. Um, I really, really enjoyed talking to her at Super Zoo. And she said um, she's trained service dogs for the past 20 years for people with physical disabilities, um, offers a window into the world of man's best friend. She believes that dogs are attuned to their owner's needs and emotions and shares tips she thinks every dog owner should know. Takes pr- uh, So basically, I think I'm on the right track here. Social learning is you use your normal everyday language you would normally do. So I, I today, prime example, I'm sat outside. It's been quite hot today. Got to the point, I thought, Thornton loves the sun, so she'll lay out in it all day. I can't let her do that. So, And I literally just say to her, you know, it's a little bit too hot now. Go inside. And she goes inside. I don't say, you know, eh, sit, you know, come on. We've got to go inside and weird commands or anything like that. I just say, talk to her like she's normal. She's like a human, <laughs> basically, is what I'm doing. But it's everyday language that I use. But I think she understands, like, like Jennifer's saying is, Dogs are a little bit more attuned to what we want from them, and and we don't. They don't necessarily need these sit to do this and lay down to do that. And I've often said that. Someone asked me the other day, "Oh, you gave your dog a treat with, without making him do a trick?" <laughs> no, I just gave my dog a treat. Hmm. That's what I did. Is it is it is it necessary to do that before they have a treat yeah, or eat their yeah, food yeah, or? I say, walk through a door. Or when I just shout, meet me in the kitchen. Oh, they are good with meet me in the kitchen. Cause meet they know. me in the kitchen is like they're <laughs> one of their best <laughs> commands. <laughs> they, they love to meet in the kitchen for a little treat. But you just have to say, meet me in the kitchen, and they come in. Well, so they I'm going to re- review. I, I don't think I did the best explanation there of the book itself, but it's. Yeah, I, I know it's more of a social learning. That's what it is. More sociable, more... N- normal language that you use every single day um so here we go um so they didn't give them obedience commands but the dogs you know they would sit down the dogs would sit down (laughs) young dogs in europe did the same thing as young dogs in america a nine-month-old black lab jumped onto a counter to sniff the cheese selection at the market a small mixed breed stopped to sniff each interesting spot when a young bulldog resisted going down the stairs to the underground the owner coaxed him down each new step 
A man with a very young puppy walked quickly to keep the puppy from picking up objects he found along the way, and nothing she saw made her think that European dogs were born well-behaved. Yeah? So she's not saying, oh, dogs that are bred over there, they're bred you know, differently, and they just bred with really good manners. <laughs> uh, the general public ignored the... I think the you're born with manners. I think you have to learn them. That's what I'm saying. Oh. That's okay. what we're saying. Is she's not saying, oh, they're just born polite and <laughs> well-behaved. The general public ignored the dogs. She never saw anyone ask to pet or give treats to a stranger's dogs. When I approached to inquire about a dog's age and breed, the re response was brief. If I gave a compliment, the answer was often, oh, thank you, that's very kind. This non-interaction included other dogs as well. Dogs would see each other or stand near each other, but were not allowed to sniff or play. As she examined her notes, she couldn't help... But help notice that the way dogs are treated in Europe is strikingly similar to the way we treat or strive to treat service dogs in the US. And people do act differently towards service dogs. You know, you're not to interrupt them when they're working. You let well, them be. And there's more people are more relaxed around service dogs because That's there's right. an expectation that the service dog is not. It's almost it's almost they have more respect yeah. for a service dog than they do a dog that's not working or is not a service dog from an early age the environment created for service dogs is meant to ke to keep them calm and comfortable which keeps them quiet as well young service dogs in training are walked through crowds of people who ignore them children are taught not to distract them the dogs are not able to sniff or play while they're working we treat service dogs this way because we understand that interacting with them makes training harder for their handler as a dog trainer, she understands how access to many environments and being ignored by strangers creates success for dogs and their people. When strangers frequently offer treats and attention or allow their dogs to rush into another dog's space, it produces specific emotional responses, which will arise each time to a new person or a strange dog approaches. Sometimes this emotion is pleasure, but more often anxiety, over-exuberance, or defensive behavior is manifested. There is no need to ask a dog to sit if no one is approaching. Nor is there a reason a dog would pull towards strangers who have typically ignored him. If being taken to new places were a regular occurrence, occurrence, it would not excite a dog into lunging through doorways. If barking and pulling were consistently ignored in young dogs, those behaviours could never become a game or a way to get attention. Unlike the restrictions put on US dog owners, Europeans are able to consistently expose their dogs to new sounds, sights, and smells, which mentally enriches the dog without overstimulating them. If a dog receives no reinforcement from strangers, the owner will never have to calm an excited dog or manage a fearful one. It gives dogs freedom to focus on their owners because nothing, in nothing interesting is coming at them from another source. People have the freedom to work or relax with their dogs in a variety of environments without needing to fend off a strange person or dog. And their dogs gain com confidence from knowing exactly what to expect. So when she reported back to her friends, she told them that they should have no trouble at all raising their puppy to be a well-behaved European dog. Their fellow Londoners would do 75% of the work for them by ignoring the dog, keeping their children from interacting with him, allowing him access to a wide range of socialization opportunities and keeping their own dogs under control. My friends would only need to build a strong bond with their puppy and teach him basic manners. It turns out that not it's not dog owners who are doing things differently across the pond. It's everybody else. Isn't that interesting? It is good. And I do agree. I also, and I, uh, this was, this topic was brought up on Linda's, oh gosh, I think it's the hierarchy of dogs if I'm not wrong on Facebook. And it was posted in there. And I can speak to both experiences. And that's right. Dogs can go to far more places in England than they can here, certainly in Vegas with quite a lot of restrictions. So they don't get lots of experience. People love to crate their dogs here for long periods of time. And in England, they don't. And, and Europeans in general are walkers, big walkers. People walk so much in Britain. They've named potato chips after walkers. There's so many of them. Is that a joke? Oh. <laughs> oh. Interesting. I didn't get it. I, n yeah. Walkers, Chris. Yeah. I could eat a bag of those, by the way. <laughs> you took me off my. You took me off my my. It was a good. You joke. took me off kilter. It was a good joke, though. 
But people do walk a lot, don't they, Jim? Think about us on Christmas Day when we're in England. What do we do? We walk, go walk, go walk. We go for a morning Christmas walk and you see what everybody. Do I, do? I do every day here. And it's lovely. Walk, go walk, go walk. Yeah, but they walk more. They walk more. And because you can take more places, they have lots more experience. And it's not a novelty. I feel like it's a novelty here. When someone sees you with a dog outside of a coffee shop, people come up all the time, don't they, Jim? I mean, we're forever saying, can you just ignore my dog? <laughs> you know, can I pet this? Can I pet? No, don't pet my dog. And it's, it just seems like there's a novelty here because they are restricted. They are restricted where they can go. And people are not big walkers as they are in other countries. So I think that has a lot to do with exposure. And they just they used to being places and people not fawning all over. I thought it was very, very interesting. And lots of people jumped in on that post. There was a lady I just read a uh, short, yeah, short while ago. She said, I'm in Austria. And let me tell you about Austria. And it was so fantastic what she was telling me about being a pet parent in Austria. You even have to pay a dog tax that she wasn't quite sure where it went. She thinks it goes to funding a lot of the really, really lovely dog parks, you know, and paying for the poop bags and all that good stuff. She says there's tons and tons of information coming from the government, I think she said, about nutrition and what's in, you know, kibble and stuff like that. I mean, I thought, whoa, that's, that's, they're way ahead with that kind of thing. There are laws where you can't leave them crated up for hours and hours and hours on end. There's laws where you can't tether them up. I mean, just across the whole place, you can't tether your, your dogs outside. It sounds like, uh, she was saying, the dog tax, she goes, is to tell you it's a privilege to have a dog. That's good. It's really good, isn't it? So I thought that was a really good article. I thought, ooh, uh, you know how people are going to get what do you mean what do you mean American dogs not not European dogs <laughs> and it just wasn't that well, it was a fantastic observation I remember when I res- registered one of the cars recently and I asked about the uh, the oh. cost of the spay and neuter plates and I said well where what organizations benefit from, from, from the extra revenue from these plates and they couldn't answer me no they couldn't you know what oh I need to write a note about that because I'm actually email them and ask them so so here in Henderson yeah you register your vehicle and does a portion of it go to them, or do they ask you for the money to go uh, to them? If you get a custom plate, like the spay and neuter plate in particular, uh-huh. it says in the uh, descriptions of the plates that it benefits you know, local charities. That's right. Okay, which ones? Yes. Re- please remind me to shoot them an email, because I want to find out, because I don't know of any, any organizations, and I know all the rescues in town, who benefit from that. Uh, yeah. I don't know any, because they would mention that, that's for sure. If that helped fund them. Hmm, interesting, interesting, interesting. So the last thing we're going to talk about, the last thing we're going to talk about is the hybrid bird species discovered in the Amazon for the very first time. What the heck? What the heck? Is the species of bird first described in 1957, but then not seen again until it rediscovered... The four, dodo. 45 years later. The dodo. No, 45 years later. The albatross. Oh, you're really getting on my nerves now. Which can, one is can it? You, well, can you just let me get to it? I know it? about extinct birds. Let me get to it. First described in 1957, not seen again until 45 years later, is even more mysterious than previously thought. It turns out that the golden-crowned mannequin, a small, vivid green bird with a yellow noggin, Noggin is your head. It's actually the result of a hybridization event between two other species of mannequin birds. While hybridization, that's an interesting word for me, among vertebrates in the wild is rare, it does still happen. They've seen this occur, for example, with grizzly and polar bears in the Arctic. Even rarer, however, is when these hybrids become reproductively isolated from either of their parents and go on to form their own population and eventually their own species. There are a handful of known cases of this occurring, such as the red wolves in the eastern United States and the Climen dolphin in the Atlantic Ocean. The latest example, though, is the very first known case of hybrid bird species found in the Amazon rainforest. And the discovery is reported in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Isn't that? It's a cute little thing, too. That's really interesting. Anyway, genetic tests of the elusive species, and here's a big word for the name of the species, Lepidrothrix villaboasi, reveal, I wouldn't butcher that, revealed that it's the result 
of a hybridization event that occurred between the snow-capped mannequin and the opal-crowned mannequin some 180,000 years ago. It is thought that the configuration of the landscape in this region led to the hybrid being isolated from both species and eventually its evolution into a new species. Interestingly, the distinctive gold head on the males, which sets them apart from either of their parent species, is likely a result of this hybridization event. Looking at the keratin structure of the crown feathers, they found some striking differences. Both parent species have a distinct keratin structure, giving one a bright white head and the other highly reflective feathers. This allows both males and sp females to spot each other in the dim light of the forest. And the keratin structure seen in the feathers of the gold crown mannequin, however, show a mix of both parents. And uh, it goes on just to conclude with this. The gold crowned mannequin ends up with an intermediate keratin structure that does a poor job of making either the brilliant white or the reflective iridescence of the parental uh, species. And it, that's what the study explains. Uh, the co-author of that, that uh, study was Jason Weir. And it is likely that soon after the hybridization event, the species had a dull white or gray head. Only later did the males evolve a golden crown on their head to increase their visibility in the forest that they've adapted. And this resulted in the unique colors now seen in each of the three species. Mm. Don't you love that? You have a golden crown on your head. I'm, yeah, because I'm the queen of rock and roll dog. That's mm. why. I find that very, very interesting. Those three species, one of them is the Villa Boasi and the ooh, Nata, Nata Eri. Nata Eri and the Iris Eucephala and the Iris Iris. That's the easiest one. I'll uh, put these links up on Facebook. Very, very interesting. We love anything to do with animals, any kind of animal, don't we, Jen? We do. We just love it. By the way, uh, did I talk about the, the little tortoise, the desert tortoise that our friend Brandy found on the street? Yes. Uh, well, uh, did we talk about it on the air or did we just talk about it? I don't we think we did, but... My friend Brandy went out walking her dog late at night and her dog came back and put something very gently down at her feet and there's a little tortoise with three legs, lost a leg. And uh, she had to she had to gather information. Uh, she reached out to me. I don't know much about tortoises, so I... And, uh, that was, I'm making a laugh because I kept saying tortoises. Is that correct? I feel like I want to say torti. Torti. I want to say torti. I feel like it, plural should be torti. <laughs> Anyway, so I went, tortitutis. I went on to Facebook and I just said, any of my friends experts in tortoise, desert tortoise? Well, I did not know I had so many secret tortoise loving friends. So many of them. And some of them were your friends, Jim, who I was shocked at. Mm. I was just like, whoa. Musician turtle keeper. Yeah. And they were so helpful. People were tagging experts in and hey, join this group, and this group will help. I was stunned, and I learned a lot. She learned a lot, and she named him Groot. I said, you know, if Groot can't get around, we can stick him a Lego wheel onto his um, shell underneath to help him get around his tiny little thing. But the stuff you have to learn, uh, 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 brama brumation, when they hibernate, mm -hmm. and I tell you something, Tortoise people are very nice. They're so nice in these groups. You know how sometimes these groups on Facebook, people get really like, ah, you know, one-upmanship and criticizing people. Oh, no, 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 no. Lots of, lots of really good advice. I'll put some of those groups up for you if you happen to have a desert tortoise. But, you know, some people have to force them into bromation. Weight has a lot to do with it. Uh, people the other day when it was raining were saying, I've heard it's really good, but my tortoise out in the rain, so you can have a little drink and soak the shell. It was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Or I've checked on him, and he seems can to be okay. you put coconut oil on the tortoise's I shell? Have no idea, Jim. It'll be in that group, though, if I ask. And they ask about food and things you can naturally grow and things that are in the desert they can eat. Very, very, very very lovely group of people. It was fantastic. And uh, Groot is doing very, very well. And that's all that counts. Yeah. So he's got his three little legs and it looked like an old, very old injury healed over. So who knows what happened? Don't think he was born that way. I think he actually got injured. But little Groot is doing very, very well. But it does seem that if you don't know what you're doing with a desert tortoise, I guess, or tortoise in general, you can really affect their health if you don't know what you're doing. 
So that's important. And I'll put those groups up in case you want to learn a little bit more. Are you thinking of getting a tortoise or you want to know, you know, a little bit more about them, how to care for them. Well, like I said, tons of information in the show this week. It's gone really fast, actually. <laughs> Don't you think, Jim? It's gone super duper fast. Desert tortoise, a new bird, DNA, Darwin's DNA, European dogs, and a great book review. Well, that's it. So remember, if you've liked the show, of course, we would love for you to share it with your friends. And if you're listening on your phone, your laptop, your iPad, smartphone, just hit the share button. And uh, we're always glad when people do that. We like people to go away from the show every single week with a little piece of information that they didn't know. And, of course, you can find us on all those social media accounts. Make sure you post pictures of your pets. Tell us all about them. Tell us why you love them. And uh, don't be shy post those pictures remember you can always help an animal in need either rescue adopt donate volunteer or share their information or change their diet <laughs> would be a really good thing to do look into your diet and see what improvements you can make rescue your next family member replace the word shop with adopt and be kind to all animals thank you jim for pushing the buttons today a lot of buttons to be pushed and uh, thanks to my two little monkey monkey dogs being in a studio, they're quiet as little, the little little Mises. Oh gosh, isn't that funny, Mises? We, we know it's not Mises, but we like to say that Mises. It was one of our first shows ever, I think. Mises. Mises. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> it's been a good show. It's been a fun show, and today you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it's all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And always kiss your pets good morning and good night. And I will see you next time. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember... Give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our host as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. 